All right, Matthew 7, there's so much content here. It's a good thing I don't have to preach through the entire chapter. This isn't our Bible study because there's so many things. You'd probably be here for a few hours. But um, we're going to be discussing a topic that I've actually preached on a couple times in the past, but I want to um, dedicate an entire sermon to just this subject of, of bearing fruit and salvation. I've, I've touched on it. Last year I preached a sermon about beware of false prophets, which obviously this is a great passage that, that covers that, about wolves in sheep's clothing and, and things like that. We're going to get into that. We're going to touch on that a little bit today. And I brought up the, the topic of fruit and bearing fruit. And um, by the fruits you shall know them. And there's another sermon I preached a little while ago too that kind of brought up the same subject. But there's enough information there's enough scripture to dedicate completely just one entire sermon to it and there's a very common teaching that i've heard you know that that many people believe and that's if you can tell if someone is saved based on their lifestyle and i don't believe that to be true now you may get some kind of indications or some warnings but what I'm referring to here is people will say, well, you know, look at that, that drunkard. There's no way that person could be saved because he's drinking alcohol. If he was saved, he wouldn't be drinking anymore. He would have kicked that by now. And that's a false doctrine. That is not true at all. The Bible says that, you know, there's one way to be saved, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. And just because someone commits a sin or continues in a sin after they've received Christ as their Savior, after they put their faith in Christ, does not mean that they are not saved anymore. But in def like when people try to defend this way of thinking, defend this argument, obviously they have some kind of Bible to go back to. And what they always go back to without fail is, well, what about their fruits? The Bible says, by the fruits you shall know them. By the fruits you shall know them. And this is what people always will quote. And we're going to go and see that. That's why we started off here in Matthew chapter 7. Because... And look down, if you would, at, at verse number 13. Because the interesting thing about salvation is that even though it truly is easy to get saved, as we know, it requires no effort on our part. It's not our works. It's not our obedience to the law. It really is easy. It's as simple as, re as receiving a free gift. It doesn't require the drunkard to give up drinking. It doesn't require the, the druggie to give up using drugs. You know, It doesn't require the fornicator to stop fornicating in order to get saved. Those things are not a requirement for our salvation. But even though it is very simple, it's just as simple as receiving that free gift, the Bible tells us that most people will still end up going to hell and most people still do not receive that gift. Look at verse number 13 of Matthew 7 where we started. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Straight there just means narrow. It doesn't mean not crooked. That would be if there was a G-H in there. The word straight, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, that means like a straight line where it's not curving to the left or to the right. But here it says that straight gate, S-T-R-A-I-T, that just simply means narrow. It means narrow. It says, enter you at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. There's lots of ways to go to hell. Basically, it's anything, you know, all kinds of sin, all kinds of false religions. You're following all these different things. They all will lead to hell. There's many ways that will lead you there. But there's one way that leads to heaven. And that's why it's narrow. That's why it's straight. It's not because it's difficult, like the modern versions will try to tell you. They'll, they'll corrupt the God's word and say that difficult is the way instead of narrow is the way. Because it's not difficult to receive a gift, but you have to receive that one gift. It has to be just through Christ. It has to just be by your faith. That's why it's narrow. There's not multiple ways to heaven. There's just one. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If there is many ways, like there is for destruction, I mean, that would be wide. That would be broad. The way to destruction is many ways, but Jesus Christ is one way. Salvation is one way. And that's what it says in verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The Bible says there's many that, that go to destruction, and there's few that find salvation. This almost sounds counterintuitive because you think that, well, salvation's a free gift. I mean, it's just as simple as putting your faith in Christ. It's just as simple as receiving that gift. Why would there be few that, that are saved? 
Well, anyone who's gone out soul winning kind of understands that because people have free will and they choose to believe in other things. They've been influenced by the devil. They've been influenced by their own sin. They've been influenced by their own pride. They want to think that, no, 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 it can't be that easy. I have to do something. I have to have more of a part in my salvation than simply just humbling myself to receive a gift. There's lots of reasons why people don't accept it. Even though it may be counterintuitive because the, the best news in the world, excuse me, that you can ever receive is that, hey, here you go. I want you to be saved. You just take this and you're saved. That's it. Saved forever. Eternal life. You have it. That's the best news you could ever receive in your life. I don't know. I mean, I can't think of anything better than just receiving a free gift to go to heaven. Amen. It couldn't get any easier. And um, yet there's still a lot of people. The Bible says there's few that find it. Now, it's not few because they weren't willing to clean up their life. It's not few because they say, well, I've heard about Jesus and I heard oh, he, you know, he paid for all my sins on the cross, but I just don't want to give up my drinking. Therefore, you know, because people have that mindset, I don't want to, I don't want to quit my sin. That's why there's few that find it. That's not true. It's simply because they didn't receive Christ as their Savior. It has nothing to do with them cleaning up their life and, and living a righteous life in order to get saved. Now let's dig in by understanding what fruit is from Scripture. Okay? Um, it has to be taken in context. First of all, look at like anything. Anything that you look in the Bible obviously has to be taken in context. When we're looking at fruits in the Bible, context is important because just that word fruit doesn't always, isn't always referring to the same exact thing every time it's used. Okay? But um, in regards to knowing people by their fruits, that context is the same because that only, only occurs you know, a, a lot less often than just the word fruit does in the Bible. Look at verse number 15. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So he's giving them a warning, right? Beware. There are people that are false prophets. People are going to try to deceive you. There's people out there that it says on the outside, hey, it looks like they're wearing sheep's clothing, right? The Bible um, refers to believers as sheep, right? We're, we're sheep. Christ is the great shepherd. We're his sheep. And there's going to be some people that are going to come to you and they're going to look like a sheep. And this is one of the reasons which is why I don't believe that you can just look at a person and how they're living on the outside to know for sure if they're saved. Because these people on the outside, they look good because they look like a sheep. It says, but inwardly, on the inside, they're ravening wolves. They're actually, you know, wolves like to eat sheep. So they're disguising themselves to get in among the sheep that they may devour them. And this is what we're being warned about. And this happens. There are people that... that are bad people inside. They're, they're wolves and they're looking to destroy Christians and looking to destroy the church and they're looking to destroy people. But they, on the outside, they look great. They'll say the right words. Hey, brother, how you doing? Hey, I'm, amen, I'm praying for you. Right? Yeah. Now, a lot of people, oh, well, you, you know, by the fruits you should know them. Obviously, this person, say, they must be saved because they're saying the right things and they go to church every week. They carry their Bible with them. They come in, they're ready to go. Doesn't mean that's not just a disguise. Now, I'm not saying that you just like look at everyone as if they're a wolf, but um, we just need to be aware that this does happen and never to put too much trust in any one man ever. Whether that be with your kids, with your spouse, what, you know, being alone with people. They may look good on the outside. You don't know always what's on the inside. Um, there is a way to, to, to get to know that a little bit. We'll get into that in a, in a minute. But um, let's keep reading here. So verse 15, he's, he's giving us a warning about false prophets that are in sheep's clothing. And then verse 16 says, Ye shall know them. Wait, who's them? The false prophets we just read about in verse 15, right? Ye shall know them by their fruits. Now, is this saying that you're going to know every single Christian by their fruits? No. He's saying this is how you can identify and how you can spot those false prophets because when they come to you, they're going to be looking good. They're going to come in sheep's clothing. 
He says, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? So since he uses the word fruits, now he's using a, a comparison here of actual fruit, right? Grapes grow on a grape vine. You're not going into the thorn bush to try to get grapes. The thorn bush is, is, is a weed. It's, you know, it's not bearing that fruit. Um, or figs, of th you know, if you want figs, you go to a fig tree. You're not going into the thistles and thorn bush and the brambles and stuff to get good fruit, right? That, those things don't bring forth good fruit. And that's why he says in verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, so because of this, by their fruits ye shall know them. So he uses that word, that, that phrase twice, by their fruits ye shall know them. But then he gives us this whole explanation of what he's talking about, right, with the fruits. Now, What's interesting, it says that a good tree, like if you're a good tree, you cannot bring forth evil fruit. He says you can't do it. But a corrupt tree, those wolves, they can't bring forth good fruit. So here's the key. We, now, we have to understand what is fruit. Now, if a false prophet is in sheep's clothing, Obviously, there's going to be some things that they're doing to make them look like a sheep. But that's not fruit. Like I said, someone coming into church, bringing their Bible, maybe even just using the right language, saying things that to, to fit in. That's not fruit. Being nice to someone, other people say, oh, well, you know, um, and we'll get to that in a, in a little bit later in the sermon about Galatians 5 about the fruit of the Spirit. And they'll say, oh, well, this person's kind and they're, you know. That's not the fruit that he's talking about here. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Trees that bring forth fruit, as we learn from Genesis chapter 1, everything brings forth after their kind, which is the reason why good trees can't bring forth evil fruit and evil trees can't bring forth good fruit because they're going to bring forth fruit after their own kind every single time without fail. Um, <clears throat> we're going to prove this a little bit later. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it now because it just makes sense. Our fruit is a reproduction of yourself. So the Bible talks about fruit um, in, in many ways. I'm, and I'm kind of going to be getting it out of order in my notes here, but that's fine. In Luke chapter 1, you don't have to turn there. When the Bible's talking about fruit, sometimes it talks about the fruit of your womb. In Luke 1, 41, it says, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So the fruit of someone's womb is, is obviously here talking about a child. It's talking about the child within there. That's her fruit. When, when God said to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, he was talking to them about reproducing. Fruit is always a reproduction. When you have a tree outside, you have that apple tree, when it brings forth fruit, it's gonna, it's, the tree is going to be reproducing and bringing forth the seeds that's contained in that fruit that one day, if, they, if they're left and they fall, they'll die and, and get sown into the ground and will bring forth another tree, another apple tree. It's not going to bring forth an orange tree. It's not going to bring forth a lemon tree. It's going to bring forth after its kind. An apple tree cannot bring forth oranges. Neither can an orange tree bring forth apples. Right? It's another way of saying it. They bring forth after their own kind. So when you have an evil tree, a bad, wicked person, a reprobate, a false prophet, and I'm not going to get too much into it. We've covered this in previous sermons about how wicked and reprobate false prophets are. And you could, I'm going to probably have referenced Jude and, and uh, 2 Peter 2. I've got one of those here referenced real slightly. But you read those two chapters. Those are both giving us warnings about false prophets and how wicked and evil and bad they are that they're children of the devil. When someone gets to the point to where they're a child of the devil, they can't be saved. They're already born into that family. They become that child the same way that when we're born into God's family, we become a child of God. 
We're always his children. We can never become a child of the devil because we already have a father. We've already been begotten again. Where we're spiritually born again. But if someone becomes spiritually born of the devil, that's where they are. They're damned. Their fate is sealed. And that's what these false prophets are that he's talking about. Okay? And these are the people how you're going to know them by their fruits because the false prophet, they cannot get people saved. They cannot convert people to Jesus Christ. They are not converted themselves. They cannot reproduce spiritually in other people. And yes, it's a very biblical concept and one is very important to understand and not just to brush off and say, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Because people will, will say that, oh, you go out and you get people saved and they have a, the problem with you saying it. Say, God's the one that saves. Well, we know God's the one that gives us the power you know, to, to save people and, and because of Jesus Christ's blood and because of the Holy Spirit, you know, the, God's word being sown in their hearts, that's why they get saved. But God doesn't do it alone. And Paul himself in many of the epistles refers to people that he got saved. And that's why it says, on some have compassion, make a difference, on others save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire, even hating the, the garment spotted by the flesh. He's saying to save them. And he's not talking about a, 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 a physical fire, like your house is on fire to save them out of their house. He's talking about their soul, their spirit. And um, Paul talks about people who, you know, whom I've begotten in my bonds, people that he's given spiritual birth to, that he's like their father. He says, um, you have many brethren, but, but uh, only one father. And um, obviously God is our father, but, but there's a sense of where when you get somebody saved, when you give them the gospel, you are kind of their, in, in a way, a spiritual father to them. Not the spiritual father, not like God the father, so don't, don't mistake me there. But um, you know, getting someone saved, these are all biblical words and concepts and that that is the way that it is according to the bible that we do go out and get people saved and why that's important to under to know that is because the false prophet can't go out and get somebody saved they don't have the holy spirit they're not going to be walking in god's will they're wolves on the inside god knows their hearts they can't bring forth good fruit. When a Christian reproduces and brings forth after his kind, he's going to bring forth another Christian. A believer brings forth another believer. And that's why we go out and preach the gospel to people. We're already believers. We believe this book is fact. We're trying to show people and persuade them that they can receive that free gift, that they could receive the seed that's being sown, and that it could take root in their heart, and they can become a believer also. <clears throat> The false prophet can't do that. So one way, if you want to identify false prophets, it's his fruit. Is he getting people saved? Talk to his, his, his quote-unquote converts because the, the false prophet is going to be making people twofold more the child of hell than themselves. According to the Bible, they're going to be getting people you know, converted, but it's not going to be to the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the be best ways, turn if you would to Matthew 12, because this leads right into my next point anyways. Matthew 12, we're going to start reading in verse number 30, because here's another reference to knowing a tree by his fruit. Verse number 30 says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be, given un shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. The tree is known by his fruit. Now, I'm going to pause right here real quick because this is important. I, read, I started at verse 30 for a reason. I could have started at verse 33 about the trees. But he's talking about that, the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Right? This is a sin that someone could commit where they become reprobate, where they become rejected. He says, you know what? If you do this, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you have never forgiveness. That's why he follows that up with, well, either make the tree good and the fruit good or the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt. Because once you cross that line and become reprobate and become rejected, you're not going to be a good tree. All that's left for you is an evil tree. Now, 
It's also important that, that it, he's talking about trees, right? As we mentioned, I've mentioned this in the past, not every fruit, not every, every fruit that's produced by a tree becomes another tree. A tree is something that actually is bringing forth, right? So think about this now. Anyone who's, who's out there, any Christian that's winning souls, who's converting people, making other believers, they could be considered a tree because they are bringing forth after their own kind. They're reproducing. They're being fruitful. However, someone who's not doing that, who's not bringing forth after their own kind, maybe there, there's two ways to think about this. You could say, well, there's someone else's fruit because someone else got them saved, right? They're the fruit. They're the result of someone else, but they haven't become a tree yet to reproduce after their own kind. So they're either, they're either still just that fruit that hasn't become a tree, or they're a tree that's not producing any fruit, which there are trees. Like we, you know, we have an apple tree out there. It's not producing fruit. You know, sometimes it flowers. You know, if it's not pollinated, all the other things aren't happening to it. It won't ever produce fruit, but it's still an apple tree. But you won't know what kind of tree that is until it does bring forth fruit. So there's a lot of people out there. They're not bringing forth any kind of fruit at all. So, how do you know what kind of tree it is? You don't. That's why you can't always know whether or not a person is saved. You could know whether a prophet is a false prophet. That was the context that we first saw in Matthew 7. He's talking about false prophets and identifying them. But this isn't talking about identifying your average Christian. By, your, by their fruits you shall know them. So, Let's keep reading here in Matthew 12. We were at Matthew uh, 12, verse 33. Let's look at verse number 34. He says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And this is one of the keys also for identifying someone um, of what they believe. This is the way that I use to determine whether or not somebody's saved. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. Your heart's on the inside. So if you have that false prophet who's a ravening wolf on the inside, he may be able to, to fool people sometimes and say the right thing sometimes, but out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth is going to speak. He's, you, know, he's, you give him enough time to talk and it'll come out. He'll expose himself. Because what's in his heart is wicked. And even just people in general, not just a false prophet, but when I go and talk to someone, hey, what makes a person saved? Whether or not their faith is in Christ to save them. How am I going to find that out? You ask. That's what we do all the time. We go out soul winning. Hey, do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? If you die today, are you going to heaven? Do you know that for sure? And they'll either say yes or no. If they say yeah, well, why? Why do you think you're going to heaven? Well, they're going to tell you. I mean, unless they want to lie and deceive you for some strange reason, well then, okay, then maybe I'll get it wrong if somebody just purposely wants to lie and tell me that they believe and they don't really believe. But I'll ask them, and, and most of the time, as far as I can tell, people are pretty honest. They'll say, you know, either they're trusting in their works, they're trusting in being a good person, they're trusting in not having done anything that bad or, or you know, they're, they're Christian, they believe in Christ, but, you know, they believe you have to be baptized, they'll tell you these things. And the reason why I'll tell you is because you follow up with the next question. So, you know, if, if someone tells me, say, well, I, you know, I believe in Christ, which is the right answer, I'll say, is that all you have to do? Now they have an opportunity if there's something else they're trusting in to tell me. Well, no, no, no. I mean, you have to live the right way. That's what some people will say then. Well, they've just, they've just expressed what they believe. It's not the correct belief. This is how you can know what people believe and what they're all about. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Verse number 35. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words... Thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Words are very important in, in understanding whether or not a person is saved way more than just are they, are they drinking? Are they committing this sin? Are they committing that sin? That's not going to tell you whether or not a person is saved. 
Now, if you see someone, or if you know someone, and, and they are living just this life of habitual sin, you should talk to them. Because either way, they need help. They need to be getting got right back on the right path. If, if someone has a testimony of salvation, yet they're living in, in, in wickedness and sin and living a life of debauchery, hey, you, need, you ought to talk to them anyways because they need to get right with God. First, you ask them, hey, you know, for sure you're saved, and then, and then just, you know, rebuke them or get, a, you know, get them right with God. You know, show them some more scripture. Be like, look, man, you, you can't be living this way. But either way, your, your reaction should be the same. You don't just be like, oh, yeah, that person can't be saved. And it, this, is what, this is what bothers me, too, is that the people who, who hold to this type of a doctrine, they have a tendency to just say, they, they judge in their minds, yeah, this person's not saved, and they don't do anything about it except maybe just treat them a little bit worse than everybody else. Instead of thinking, hey, I don't think this person is saved. Why don't I just go and give them the gospel then because I don't think that they're saved. But no, the people who, who kind of hold to this doctrine of, oh, well, by the fruits you shall know them, they, they look at people and then they'll say, well, that person can't be saved because they're still drinking. They'll gossip about that person. They'll talk about them behind their back but they won't ever approach them and confront them and love them because if they weren't really saved, why wouldn't you love them enough to give them the gospel? Get them saved. This, this happens in churches all throughout the country. People, people will, will see people that they'll be like, oh, that, that person can't be saved because they do this or because they do that and they know so much about their life. And, um, but they'll never go and confront them. Flip, if you would, just over to Matthew 13. Here in Matthew 12, Matthew 13, verse number 18, we're going to see the parable of the sower. We're not going to read the whole parable, but um, we're going to see Jesus' explanation of it. Matthew 13, verse number eight, 18. Matthew 13, 18 says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So I was explaining it and saying very, right off the bat, and you could get, we're not going to go through all the parables, but um, the seed is the word of God and the sower is, is, is preaching the word of God. And, you know, the word of God gets, gets preached to this person. So the seed is trying to get sown in their heart. But this very first example, you know, the devil comes and he takes it away because they didn't, they didn't receive it. They heard it. The seed is trying to be, you know, the seed is getting thrown out there. Someone's preaching the gospel. Someone's preaching the word of God. It's, it's going out, but it hasn't been received. So they hear it, but then what the devil's going to do is he's going to come by and he's going to take it so that they just forget all about it and then just continue along with their life. That's the seed which is sown by the wayside. Verse number 20, it says, But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. All we have to do to be saved is receive the word. Jesus Christ is the word. You receive him, you're saved. That seed takes root in your heart, you're saved. You become a new creature. There's a new life. When that, that seed is, is conceived in your heart, that brings forth a new life. It says, but in verse 21, yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the world, by and by he is offended. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the world, the word, excuse me, and he becometh unfruitful. So this example is real interesting too because it says that he becometh unfruitful. Now in order to become unfruitful, I would think that you were fruitful before, right? So there's people who they've received the word, they've brought forth fruit, but because of the riches of this world, because of the cares of this world, you know, things happen, you get distracted, and you get deceived by this world. And, and this, I've seen this happen too. People who are soul winners, they go out, they're dedicated, they're serving God, they're in church. And then, you know, they're winning souls, they get a job offer somewhere else. And it's a lot of money. And because it's such a great opportunity, they take that job offer, they move away, and guess what? There's no good church in their area. So they've moved away from a good church. Well, they're making all this money now, and it's the cares of this world and everything else that they're, that they're receiving has kind of choked the word, and they become unfruitful. 
And they stop going out and win winning souls. And they stop doing all these things because they've gotten out of the good church. And now they're more focused on their job and making money and things like that. This happens. Because that happens to someone that doesn't, oh, well, they were never saved to begin with. No, they just became unfruitful. Verse 23 says, But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now, this is interesting too because he's placing a quantity to the fruit that's being brought forth. And what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to differentiate here, and I think, I, I think you guys probably already have a good understanding of fruit, but you hear this so many times and people will try to, to confuse you a little bit and say, well, no, you know, fruit is this Galatians 5, 22. Galatians 5 says, um, in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. So they look at this and they say, you know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And they'll take someone who's a man of God, a preacher of righteousness, and they'll say, oh, see, he's preaching hate. Oh, yeah, he's real hateful, so he's not saved. Or even he's not a preacher, it's anybody. They'll look at that and be like, oh, well, where's the love? Where's the joy? Where's the peace? They must not be saved because they don't exhibit this fruit. Well, first of all, this is talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, a very specific type of fruit. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? And it also says the key to this, to understanding this passage at the end in verse 25, it says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So is it, according to this verse, is it possible to live in the Spirit but not walk in the Spirit? Yeah, of course it is. If you're not walking in the Spirit, do you think anyone's going to see the fruit of that Spirit? No. Does that mean you don't have the Spirit at all? No. You still have the Spirit, but you also still have the flesh. So when you're walking in the flesh, you're going to see the fruit of the flesh. When you're walking in the Spirit, you'll see the fruit of the Spirit. But it's possible to have, one, to, to, to have the Spirit and not walk in the Spirit. So you can't look at the fruit of the Spirit and be like, well, that person isn't saved because I don't see this stuff right now. It could just mean they're walking in the flesh. But the other thing is this. Now, we see this fruit in Matthew 13 with the parable of the sower, and he's talking about bringing forth 30, 60, 100. How could that fruit be the same fruit as Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit? How do you have 50 love, 100 joy, 60 peace? It doesn't make any sense. Obviously, the fruit that it's referring to in these two passages are different, but this is what the people, they don't understand this, and, and, and they've been taught a certain way or whatever, and, and they'll try to just say, well, no, no, the Bible says, and they'll, and they'll, they'll quote these random, you know, you'll know them by their fruits and things like that, and, and well, the fruit is, uh, is joy and peace, and, you know, and they'll start mentioning Galatians 5. These passages are talking about two different things. Now, Matthew 13 makes perfect sense about bringing forth fruit if you're actually converting people, winning them to Christ. Hey, you could win 30 people. You could win 60 people. You could win 100 people to the Lord. You can do that. You can bring forth that type of, pru of fruit in reproducing yourself and somebody else. That absolutely makes perfect sense here. The love, the joy, the peace, the long suffering. Look, that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's not the same fruit that we're talking about in Matthew 13. This is why it's so important to read everything in context and, and to start thinking about it and analyzing well, what, what makes sense here. Flip back, if you would, now to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. We spent a lot of time in Matthew. Matthew 3, because. This is the other place that people will go to that want to see this evidence of, of your salvation. And I want to clarify as well because I'm not saying that when a person gets saved, you won't see any of this evidence that people are looking for in salvation. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm not saying that a person won't start to get rid of this sin in their life. I'm not saying they won't start to go to church and won't try to serve God and won't start to do these good things because when you get saved, you do have that new creature, that new man that wants to do well. 
and that will change you and guide you and, and help you to grow and stuff. But all I'm trying to expose here and what I'm trying to say is that you can't, you, you can't say 100% of the time with everybody that that's always going to happen where you will see an outward manifestation of them walking in the spirit and doing good things and trying to serve God. They can have that spirit and not walk in that spirit. And if they're not walking in the spirit, they won't produce any type of evidence. You need to be walking in the spirit to be able to, to win someone else to Christ and bear fruit that way. Without the spirit of God, it's, you're hopeless. It's, there's no way that you can, you can do anything um, to bring forth fruit. So if you're not walking in the spirit, you're not going to be reproducing after your own kind either. You're not going to be bringing forth anything. Now, you're not gonna, it doesn't mean you're going to be bringing forth evil fruit. You're just not going to be bringing forth any fruit. Uh, Matthew 3. So this is, this is the other place that they'll like to turn to. Matthew 3, verse number 7. We're talking about this is where John the Baptist is baptizing people, right? Right before Jesus Christ comes on the scene. They'll, they'll, they'll turn to what John the Baptist says. Matthew 3, 7 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So they say, oh yeah, well, why, then, then why in the world did John the Baptist say, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance? Why would he say that? If we can't tell people by their fruits, well, again, in context, and this is what I'm saying when it's talking about um, bringing forth fruit in this context, it's always the same, or knowing people by their fruits, excuse me, knowing people by their fruits is always in the same context. He's talking to specific people here. It's not just anybody. He's talking to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees, which were false prophets of the time. They did not believe in Christ. They taught another religion. They were false prophets. Okay, we saw in Matthew chapter 7, we saw in Matthew chapter 12, you're going to know the false prophet by their fruits. So John the Baptist is looking at them and saying, he's baptizing people. Now, now do we just baptize anybody who wants to be baptized? Is it just like, hey, I want to get baptized. Come on in and get baptized. No. There's a requirement for, for getting baptized. And that is very simple. It's, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart, you may. We'll baptize anyone that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart. If they're trusting on Christ for salvation, if they're saved, they get baptized. So is John the Baptist just going to baptize anybody? Is he, if the Pharisees and the Sadducees come and say, well, come on down, I'll baptize you. No. They have to believe first. Now, in order for them to believe, they have to repent. They're not going to continue to be a Pharisee or a Sadducee if they're putting their faith in Christ to save them because that's a false religion, a false order. Look at the Apostle Paul. He was a Pharisee, but he got saved. He rejected the false works-based salvation religion and accepted Christ. He brought forth fruits, meat for repentance because he changed what he believed. He's no longer a Pharisee. It's the same way we, when people get saved. If they're truly saved, you're not going to cling to your false works-based religion. You're just not. You're not going to be like, you, you can't. You can't. I'm going to say it. Not that you're not. You can't. It's impossible to say, well, I've accept, I, I believe completely in Jesus Christ for salvation, but I also think you have to, you know, I'm still going to stay with the Catholic Church because I still think you have to get baptized. And I still think you have to take communion. I still think you have to then you didn't really put all of your faith in Christ. You see what I'm saying? Like, like you, you, can't, you can't do the both. Now, if someone just attends a Catholic church because their family goes there, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that person can't be saved, but in their heart and in their mind, they have to have rejected that religion, that, that way of salvation. And so what he's talking about here, he's talking to Pharisees and Sadducees, you need to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. You need, I need to understand that you, I mean, you reject being a Pharisee and a Sadducee in order to get baptized. And now again, we're going to see here in verse number 10, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Same reference that we saw in Matthew 7 and Matthew chapter 12. These are all talking about the same thing. In context, in scripture, 
They all use the same language. They're all talking about trees. They're all talking about false prophets. This is not a measure for every individual Christian. It's a measure for the false prophet. I've gone a little bit out of order in my notes. I'm going to skip over some of these other things. I already covered them. A couple more places. Turn, if you would please, to John chapter 4. You remember that story of the woman at the well, right? Very famous passage. She hears Jesus. She, he's preaching to her. He says that he's the Messiah. Because she says, well, when the Messiah comes, you know, we'll, we'll, he'll teach us all things. And he says, you know, he that speaketh unto you is, is basically he's saying, I'm, I'm he. I'm the, I'm the Messiah. So then she goes and, and is like telling everyone else, saying, hey, isn't, you know, isn't this the Christ? And she's leading people to Christ right away. Um, Verse number 34 says, John 4, 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. This is that, that passage in John chapter 4. And his disciples came back and he's saying that, that you know, they're asking him, whatever, if he was hungry and he's, you know, he said that he, he has meat to eat that they don't know of. And um, he explains what that is. That means to do the will of him, to do God's will. And verse 36, he says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Now, this passage, verse 35, when it says, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He's, uh, he's, this is a passage that's commonly taught about soul winning. It's commonly you know, the, the fields are white unto harvest. You hear this so many times in soul winning sermons. And it's completely accurate because that's what he's talking about here. He's referring to people as being the harvest, as being, hey, look, we need to go and reap. We need to go and, you know, and the people are primed. They're ready. John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord. You know, people have been hearing about God. They've been hearing God's word. Now the time is ready. The time is ripe. We need to send these laborers out and get these people saved because there hasn't been a better time to get them saved than right now. And that's what he's saying. He's like, it's harvest time. Let's go get them. And what are they doing? Verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit. They're bringing forth fruit. They're bringing in that fruit unto life eternal. This is what that bringing forth fruit means. And this is, this is what we need to be bringing forth in our life. Now, um, I think by this point, hopefully we all have a good understanding of fruit and, and what the Bible is talking about when bringing forth fruit. Now, with that in mind, listen to this. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 15. You're in John chapter 4. I'm going to read this parable for you from Luke chapter 13. You say, Pastor Versions, I know I've already heard all this about gathering fruit. You know, I know I understand what fruit is. I understand that it's, that it's getting people saved. I understand that it's, that it's bringing forth after your own kind and, and winning converts to Christ. And hopefully you do understand that by this point, if you didn't before. But this is where then... Once you understand that, this is why it's so important for us. And, and, and if you don't take anything else away, if you already had that concept down and this is all just review, listen to this. Okay, you're in John 15. I'm going to read Luke 13 for you. Luke 13, verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years... I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. John 15, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, 
that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse number eight says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bring forth much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. If you're saved, you can't bring forth that evil fruit. You're a good tree. But what you need to ask yourself is, are you a tree that's producing fruit? Because these are some stern warnings from the Bible about trees that don't produce fruit. About the vines that aren't producing fruit. What's God going to do with them? So I'm going to take it away. Why cumbereth it the ground? Why is it even there? It's wasting up space. It's taking up these nutrients. I'm going to plant another tree there that will bring forth the fruit. Make sure that you are a tree that becomes fruitful. You want God to use you. You don't want God to just cast you aside and be like, well, I'm done with you. Verse number 16 of John 15. The Bible says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. God wants you. This is, this is your job. You need to go out and bring forth fruit. And look at yourself today. Are you bringing forth fruit? Are you bringing people to Christ? Are you bearing that precious seed? Are you getting people saved? Because if you're not, you know, God gives you time. We saw that in another parable. He says, you know, these three years, I came up to this tree and I was looking for fruit and I didn't find any. Three years I've been looking for it. You know, there's, there's time to grow. There's time to grow from that seedling into a tree that's even capable of producing fruit. God understands this and God knows this. But don't be the tree that grows and never brings forth fruit. Now, God may have to deal with you and, and maybe it's a matter of getting rid of sin. That's why I said, well, we'll dig a pit around it. We'll dung it. Right? We'll throw some dung in there. That might be God's way of what he might have to deal with you to get you to, you know, maybe removing some sin, whatever it may be. But he says, this is our last effort. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put forth some effort at this. And after that, we're just going to get rid of it. If you're saved, God has a plan for you in your life. And part of his plan is going to be bringing forth fruit. For sure, guaranteed, without a doubt. God's will that you bring forth fruit. And if you never do that, then your usefulness to God on this, on this earth, I mean, you might as well just go to be with him then. I mean, just, just take you away. So you're not, you're not doing anything I want you to do. And we need to just make sure that we're, that we're obeying God's commands, that we're, that we're going to be fruitful and we're going to go out and, and do what he's, what he's told us to do. So hopefully you understand a little bit about fruit and salvation, but this is why it's so important is because God says that you need to be bringing forth fruit. And you shouldn't have this false concept of saying, well, I am bringing forth fruit because I'm joyful. Because I have peace. That's not an excuse. That's not the fruit we're talking about. Okay? And, and it's easy to just to blow this stuff off and say, oh yeah, well, I, well, I am fruitful. And just talk about this the fruit of the Spirit. Because, you know what, honestly, if you say that, I don't even believe that. Because if you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to be fruitful. You're going to go out and you're going to do the will of God if you're walking in the Spirit. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your words. I pray that you would please stir us up, dear Lord. Help us to become more fruitful. Help us to be trees that, that bring forth abundantly, dear Lord, that... Um, many, many souls could be saved and that, that, that eternal fruit, that's the fruit that has, that has value, dear Lord. That is the lasting fruit. It, it is of eternal value. When a soul gets saved, when someone receives your word, when someone receives that seed and gets saved, dear Lord, help us to, to go out and bear much fruit. Lord, purge away the, the dead branches in us, the, the sinful branches that are, that are holding us back from bearing even more fruit. God, it may be a little bit painful to get a snip here and there, at, at those dead branches, but, but it's going to, in the long run, help us 
to be much more fruitful, much more bountiful, dear Lord, and much more joyful. I pray that you would please just, just work with us and, um, and help us to do as much as we possibly can for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.